I stood up for these niggas, and these niggas didn't appreciate it. So when I got locked up, these niggas cheered. I took on a fight for these clowns because I didn't want them getting robbed. And they crossed me. Be advised, we have a confirmation of one auto versus Ted, 142nd is Rosecrans. Trouble-plagued rapper and actor Tupac Shakur is dead at the age of 25, just about a week after sustaining four bullet wounds last Saturday night in Las Vegas. Anything you say once, you got to be able to say twice. I'm going to respect you if you can say it twice. If you're going to speak bad about somebody, if you're going to put accusations on somebody, be able to sit down and look him in his eyes, right in the eyes, and say, yeah, I said that. I did that. When Tupac was killed in the year 1996, Death Row Records and Suge Knight both started falling apart. At the prime of Death Row Records, it was worth $100 million and had three multi-platinum albums only between 1991 to 1994. But after that incident, everything went downward for Suge Knight and Death Row Records and it never went upward after that. According to CEO of Death Row Records, Suge Knight, his artist Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg betrayed him and stabbed him in his back. Of all people that I work with, Snoop is probably the most to support the guy. Dre basically saying, you must slap. Suge Knight once was one of the richest personality in hip hop, giving us classic albums like All Eyes On Me and The Chronic. The man who made everyone around him terrified by his soul presence and was never scared of anybody. If any artist is having trouble with another party for royalties or money debt, the first guy they will call was Suge Knight. This guy Suge Knight will be the one to solve the issue with any means, from like his power to his influence to his fear. Just like how he took the royalties from Vanilla Ice for his hit record Ice Ice Baby, strangling him and threatening Vanilla Ice to throw him from the balcony of 15 floor stall building. It was definitely the one of the most terrifying moments for Vanilla Ice. Roughed one of my bodyguards up, they roughed everybody else and my whole entourage up. Suge took me out on the balcony, started talking to me personally. On the balcony? On the balcony, high above like 15 floors. He had me look over the edge, show me how high I was up there. You scared? <laughs> I needed to wear a diaper on that day. <laughs> From that situation, hip hop community knew that someone big bully with no mercy had joined the community. His strategy was simple, make money with fear. With this strategy, he climbed the ladder of success and made one of the biggest empire in hip hop history, the Death Row Records. The music business is real cutthroat. You in this office, you know what I mean, hold down a position. You don't run shit here, man. Are you here to look for a job for real or are you here to tell a joke? Get him nah, away from I ain't let you down, motherfucker. Hey, 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 the whole West Coast hip hop scene was on the Death Row Records and Suge Knight. He's an every major artist in hip hop like Dr. Dre, Snoop Dogg, Tupac were on the Death Row Records. He was signing all these rappers forcefully whether these artists want to sign under him or not, they don't have any choice. It's gonna happen. You gonna sign these, releasing Dre and DOC from Ruthless. If Suge Knight finds you, you are under him and his record label. Suge Knight signed all these rappers in minimum amount of money, not even a million dollars. He used to give some cars or mansion in rich wealthy area of Los Angeles and some cash, then boom. All your record sales, all your royalties will be under Suge Knight and Death Row Records. But we all know that bullies don't have great future and that's the universal rule. And it certainly was the same way for Suge Knight. As I mentioned earlier in the video, after Tupac died from a deadly shooting, Death Row Records and Suge Knight went downward. Artists like Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre were leaving the record label and slowly Death Row Empire started crashing out. He started catching multiple cases, spending most of the time behind bars. All the money that he made were fading and eventually in the mid-2000s he went bankrupt. 
But after he came home in 2006, after serving 9 years in prison, he tried to build the empire again but it never went same for him and his death row record. And eventually in 2018, he was sentenced 28 years in jail after he ran over two men named Terry Carter and Cleese Sloan with his pickup train. One of the men Terry Carter died from injuries and the other man Cleese Sloan suffered injuries to his head and foot. Suge Knight has been experiencing health issues in recent years and told the judge he expects to die in prison. Once, Suge Knight was in the top of rap game. His influence over LA hip hop scene was really, really, really strong. No one wanted to have problem with that man Suge Knight, but he made his own fatal downfall. His destruction was well deserved in the hip hop history. Marion Hugh Knight Jr., also known as Sug Knight, was born on April 19, 1965, in Compton, California, to his parents Marion Knight Sr. and Maxine Chapman. Both of his parents were involved in music at one point of their life. His father, Marion Knight Sr., was also a musician, and his mother, Maxine Chapman, was also involved in music, managing some of the artists around the area of Compton. So, Sug Knight kinda grew up around music. Growing up, Suge was bigger in size than most of his age, that's exactly on him the nickname of Suge the Beer. He was really kinda size of a beer. That nickname stuck with Suge Knight and it never changed. He had three siblings around him and he was youngest of them. And because he was the youngest big boy in the house, he was loved by everyone in the house. According to his mother, he was just a sweet charming boy who was loved by everyone and had no gang affiliation or stuff like that. It might be true, but the streets were telling different story. California. <laughs> They was not scared of Suge Knight. They was terrified of Suge Knight. Knight. Right. I mean, terrified. Suge Knight was a very talented football player. Due to his size, he played for defense position. And in this clip, you can see how good he plays the football. <laughs> But when Suge was in high school of Glenwood, California, he devoted most of his energy on securing athletic scholarship to college which he hoped would lead to NFL contract. He was giving his all into the sports he loved so much, even sneaking out of his house at late night just to play football. He eventually made the Dean's List at the University of Las Vegas and won his greatest achievement award of his football career, Rookie of the Year in 1985 on defense. His former coach told TMG, he was Super Bowl material, the kind of guy you love having on your side rather than making the enemy. He played football in University of Nevada for two years. Suge Knight went undrafted in 1987 NFL draft but was invited to Los Angeles Rams training camp. There, he started training with Los Angeles Rams professionally and even went to Japan with them. He was caught by Rams during the camp, but he became a replacement player during the 1987 NFL player strike and played two games for Los Angeles Rams. After 1987, he officially quit football and he never turned back at it. Marion Knight of the two down linemen in a very interesting Marion Knight. After quitting football and taking the decision to retire from his favorite sport, Suge Knight started focusing most of his time in concert management and becoming a nightclub bodyguard in Club of Los Angeles. He knew his massive body size was already a suitable position for this profession and he was on advantage. This led him to gain the wide exposure of Los Angeles nightlife. He started to realize how fascinating the nightlife could be, all the city lights, goals, parties and the money was also extreme. I think along the way he was being taught 
all about the music industry and he was fascinated. They took me on tour and I learned on tour how every person who's writing songs is getting beat out their money, like they published. In the late 80s, he started managing. Eventually, he managed Jodeci, Mary J. Blige, DLC. But chocolate was his first success story. Sugne, taunting personality and massive size was steady on the cake for him. He was building his influence over Los Angeles nightlife and it's also said that Suge ruled over the top nightclub of downtown Los Angeles area like Papi and Sound Nightclub where top music celebrities like Michael Jackson and LL Cool J used to hang out. From this job, Suge Knight gained few but very useful knowledge and information about music business and how money making it can be. He was also working as a concert manager in the area managing different events throughout the city of Los Angeles. So in overall, Sugnat was really making his way through the music business and expanding the connections throughout the industry. But Sugnat gained his first major exposure of the music business when he became bodyguard of Bobby Brown. This sent everything for Sugnat. He meets Bobby Brown at an after party. He kept Bobby Brown from getting like hit by a crazy fan and from there, boom, he's Bobby's bodyguard. Bobby Brown, who was a very popular singer and songwriter at that time, appointed Suge Knight to be his bodyguard. Bobby Brown saw the influence and fear that Suge Knight carries and how he handled himself in this kind of environment. Bobby Brown kind of showed Suge Knight the broad system of music business. Bobby Brown indirectly helped Suge Knight to establish his death row records, but we'll get into that in a minute. Working as a bodyguard of Bobby Brown, Suge Knight was willing to take any risk, even saving Bobby Brown from bounty hunters. Yeah, you heard it right. The hit was placed on Bobby's head while he was touring with AIB Sure. It was said that the hit on Bobby Head was $500,000, but when Sugnet heard about it, he stepped into the scene and used his connection to resolve the issue. So you can know how influential Hap Sugnet became. This influence and fear of Sugnet was going everywhere in Los Angeles. Bobby Brown wanted to go on tour on my prerogative tour. But he also guys some money and they had a um, contract on Bobby. They was out to they was out to kill Bobby. So we're not gonna be able to tour because Bobby's scared of these guys trying to kill him. So I confronted the guys, I dealt with the guys and I was aggressive. They made that guy apologize to Bobby. So the word traveled around that you know I was a stand up guy. Sug Knight was getting clients People were calling him to get their job done, and among those clients, his first and the most important client was Zap, aka Mario Chocolate Johnson. Johnson helped write a record called Ice Ice Baby for a white rapper named Vanilla Ice. The record exploded, and Vanilla Ice became the first rapper to really attain wholehearted mainstream acceptance. You can call Vanilla Ice that one friend who owes you money but always deny you to give the money. Yeah, that's right. That's the kind of person Vanilla Ice was. Vanilla Ice refused to pay Johnson just as he refused to pay Queen and David, whose record under pressure he sampled for Ice Ice Baby. Queen and David hired lawyers and sued Vanilla Ice. But on the other hand, Johnson aka Chocolate hired Suge Knight, who dealt with the matter in a less conventional way but far more memorable way. That incident has now become a part of music industry arsenal. So at that night, Vanilla Ice was chilling with his girlfriend in a hotel lobby of Los Angeles when Suge and his entourage approached him. When Vanilla Ice arrived back at his room, Suge was waiting for him. He took Vanilla Ice out on balcony and dangled him over the edge of 20 stories up. Vanilla Ice's life was flashing in front of his eyes. Vanilla Ice himself said, I need to wear a diaper on that day. He had me look over the edge, show me how high I was up there. You scared? <laughs> I needed to wear a diaper on that day. <laughs> I was very scared. Suk told Vanilla Ice to look over the balcony and warned him that he would be thrown over it unless his client, Chocolate, was settled. However, in an interview, Suk Knight denies all these allegations, saying Vanilla Ice was only making stories. He says you had a number of men there with guns. 
<laughs> you then took him out to the balcony, he says. Uh -huh. And you said you're going to sign over the rights. Did you, did you do that? No, I did not. It never happened? Never happened. You didn't take him out to the balcony? I had a sign. It sounds like what occurs in other <laughs> police reports involving you. Again and again, there's a pattern, on, Mr. Man. Knight, where you do that. That's not true. So from this point, the terror of Suge Knight was officially formed. Many will argue and with some authorities that this was an act of criminal extortion and that Sockler should have taken the matter to the court. The opposing view is that Vanilla Ice himself was conducting an act of robbery on a grand scale. Comment down your opinion about this situation, man. Suge had no faith in the legal system and especially lawyers. Something that would later play an important role in his own downfall. But it's not too hard to see why young men from the streets like Compton were reluctant to place their faith in a legal system which had all too often failed them. So Suk had fulfilled one of the first key rules of business, find a problem and solve it for free. Suk Knight's next major client were rapper called DOC from NWA and Dr. Dre. At the time, DOC and Dr. Dre were signed to regular contracts with Ruthless Record, a label owned by Eric Wright, aka EZE. But the business brain at Ruthless Record was Jerry Heller, a music industry veteran known for importing Pink Floyd and Elton John into America for their first tours. Jerry Heller really used an old industry trick to put EZE in the front and the other members in the NWA on the back. Dick Griffey, the former CEO of Solar Records, described DOC and Dr. Dre contracts as the worst I'd ever seen in the history of music business and said describing them as a draconian would be kind. Suk briefs in this instance was not to collect an unpaid bill as it was the case of the Johnson vs. Vanilla Ice, but to enable Dr. Dre to release music outside of his contracts with Ruthless Records. This time, EZ found himself on the receiving end of Suk's service and Dr. Dre was duly set free to record on the condition that Ruthless Records would be paid a percentage of all any proceeds. From that point onward, Suk and Dr. Dre began to redefine hip hop as a genre and as a business and they took it to another level. Dr. Dre, Suk, and several others established their show records and they set change in hip hop and Dr. Dre was duly set free to record on the condition that Ruthless Record would be a paid a percentage of all any proceeds. From that point onward, Suk and Dr. Dre began to redefine hip hop as a genre and as a business and they took it to another level. Suk personally developed the template for successful hip hop entrepreneurs to follow from Pop Daddy, Barman, Jay-Z to Damon Dash all have followed his lead and borrowed significantly from him. According to Dick Griffey, Inescope, the now world-beating record label established in 1990 by music producer Jimmy Iovine and the billionaire movie mogul Ted Fields was on the verge of closing shop a year after its formation. Fields was apparently tired of pouring his money into what was essential of following venture. The company hadn't really had any major success. Lack of major commercial success aside, Inescope did have a reputation for championing gangster rap as a genre at a time when it was political and commercial suicide to do so. The debut album of Dr. Dre, Suge Knight and Death Row Records was Chronic. The Chronic was a groundbreaking success, critically, commercially and culturally. The album sold 3 million copies, grossing $30 million. According to Dick Griffey, he said the chronic saved Inescope and made Inescope. On this basis, if Dick Griffey is to believe there is a good chance you will not ever have heard of Lady Gaga, Icon, Eminem, Black Eyed Peas, Beats by Dr. Dre Headphone, etc. The landscape of popular culture will look very different. All over the chronic was a young camera side rapper from Long Beach, California also known as Snoop Doggy Dog or Snoop for short. Suge, it is often recounted, masterminded everything from Snoop's hairstyle to his supposed gang affiliation. When Snoop's debut album was released, it became one of the fastest selling debut albums of all time. It sold 5.5 million copies, grossing $55 million. As a result of this success, this row was dominant in absolute terms. It continued to be so from 1992 to 1995.
Checked my contracts out. Sure enough, it wasn't worth the paper they were written, you know? And um, that was that for me. So I said, Dre, look, ain't no use of going back over spilled milk. I got a vision. Obviously, you got a vision. Let's just start fresh. Should he was aggressive, and he really seemed like a go-getter to me. You know what I'm saying? And he was making things happen. That's all I really care about, was getting in the studio making music. If you're gonna help me with that, so be it. Let's keep it moving. What's the urgency, Dre? Blunt. I'm out. I'm out of death row. The fallout between Dr. J and Suge Knight was more of a profitable thing to Death Row Records because after Dre left Death Row Records, Suge and Death Row found a prodigy named Tupac Sakur. But we'll get into that in a minute. Now let's see how Dr. Dre and Suge Knight came into the situation. When DOC told Dr. Dre about Suge Knight and his influence over rap scene, Dr. Dre immediately knew what kind of guy Suge Knight is. Dr. Dre told TMZ, I knew Suge was a bully, he was sourcing somebody to start business with and we went straight into that murder zone. Dre knew Suge was going to make more money off of their music than themselves. This caused Dre not to fully trust someone like Suge Knight. This was also one of the reasons for Dre and Suge fallout. Dre and Suge both were from the streets of Compton. They both knew the outcome of being on gang. Dr. Dre released his highly anticipated album The Chronic through Death Row Records and it instantly became one of the best selling albums in hip hop history. He sold more than million copies. Even though Dre had sold all those albums, the amount he personally made was really less than what he should get because of all those royalties and other stuff. Suge Knight was now touching million of dollars. At the same time, Snoop Dogg was also signed to Death Row Records and released his album Doggy Style, which also did millions of sales. So Suge was getting a lot of money and his artists were getting much less money than they should get. So this was also the reason why Dre left Death Row Records. The staff who were working at Death Row were all the gang members from Mob Pie to Blood. So Death Row was really a hub for gang rather than an actual record label. It was really difficult for an artist to focus on rapping in this kind of environment and that was the same case for Dr. Dre. He was not able to focus and create music in this kind of environment and he was tired of all these gangs, violence and stuff like that. So he decided to leave Death Row Records. But leaving Death Row Records was not that easy for Dr. Dre because he would lose all his royalties and money from his album The Chronic. He will need to start everything from scratch from the bottom. So he took this risk and leave Death Row Records and Suge Knight. But after their fallout, Suk really tried Dr. Dre to make him join Death Row Records again, but it was too late because Dre had already made up his mind. Suk Knight also said that Dr. Dre tried to have him murdered. In an interview with The Blast, Suk claims that Dr. Dre paid a hitman to kill him. Suk Knight claims that he struck a deal with Dr. Dre to collect 30% of the producer earning and that after he tried to collect the money, Dre allegedly put a hit on him. He believes that this was put in place because he survived the 2014 nightclub shooting. Suk told Blast they also got the paper trial with all the checks and proofs of when they talked to the witnesses saying that they came to them first and asked the two guys how much it cost to get rid of Suk Knight. Suk later sued Dr. Dre in 2016 claiming Dre was behind it but the case was eventually dropped due to lack of evidence and till this date the fallout between Suk Knight and Dr. Dre is one of the craziest moments in hip hop history. million dollars one for out up front in the house for your mom that's it yeah 
<laughs> All right. So when can we do this? When can you sign? Just show me the pen. This is my pen right here. We got a deal, man. <laughs> it should. Yeah. <laughs> After Dr. Dre left Suge Knight and Death Row Records, both Dr. Dre and Suge Knight were having difficult time. There were no any hot rappers other than Snoop Dogg on the record label, and the money was also slowing down. And on the other hand, Dre had just started his new record label called Aftermath Records, so it was kinda low a situation for both Suge Knight and Dr. Dre. But at that time, Suge really hit the jackpot when he signed the legendary artist of all time. Tupac Shakur in his record label Death Row Records. This move by Suge Knight was one of the most beneficial moves for Death Row Records. In 1995, Tupac Shakur, who was already a successful mainstream rapper from New York City, was imprisoned in Clinton Correctional Facility in New York for a sexual assault. At that time, Tupac was already a mainstream rapper and his album Me Against the Wall reached the top of the charts during the incarceration. He was getting shows touring everywhere in the country. Interscope Records, who Tupac was signed at that time, didn't immediately pay his $1.4 million bail. Tupac was left hanging by Interscope Records. Interscope Records kinda like refused to pay his bail of $1.4 million. Tupac was getting impatient and this was also one of the reasons why he decided to leave Interscope Records. Tupac knew Interscope wasn't loyal to him so that's why they ain't bailing him. At this time, Suk was searching for some artists to compromise the damage done by Dr. Dre after leaving Death Row Records. Suk Knight saw this opportunity to bail out Tupac and sign him to Death Row Records. Suk Knight approached Tupac in prison and offered to pay his bail on the condition that he had to sign directly to Death Row and release three albums. The impatient and desperate Tupac immediately agreed to sign to Death Row Records. It was probably one of the best decisions made by Tupac for his career. It is also said that Tupac signed the contract right there in the prison cell. Alright. So when can we do this? When can you sign? Just show me the pen. This is my pen right here. We got a deal, man. <laughs> it should. Yeah. <laughs> After signing Tupac, Death Row and Suge Knight both started getting back on the track and started touching some really big amount of money. Tupac also touched the height of his career. It was both a win-win situation for both Tupac and Suge Knight. Tupac was duly released from prison and recorded his best album, All Eyes On Me, a 27-track double album, which took only two weeks to finish. The album went to sell 10 million units grossing at least 100 million dollars. That is a profit margin of 7,042% on an initial investment made by Suge Knight of 1.4 million dollars for bailing Tupac. This was probably the best investment made by anybody in hip hop history. After this, Tupac and Death Row Records were top of the game. They were the hottest rapper out there. But only this album didn't make Tupac a superstar. His beef with Biggie Smalls, Puff Daddy and Bad Boys Records was also one of the reasons of his popularity. Ready for that raw dog shit, nigga? Okay, alright. Let me see how I'm gonna hit you with. You wanna set it off? Yeah, I'm scared to do some freestyle. I'm scared to do some freestyle. Blow, I'm too high and I might go off tempo. But now I'm back to let these niggas know just how deep my. When Tupac came out to Quad Studios, there were guys waiting for him. He ended up getting shot. Tupac Shakur and three of his group were robbed. He was shot numerous times, at least twice in the head, once in the left arm, once in the thigh, once in the groin. Well, I got shot five times. I walked in, some dudes walked in and shot me up. Uh, took some jewelry. Do you know who shot you? No. No, I don't know no. who shot me. So does that mean that you also have no idea why they shot you? 
No, I have no idea why they shot me. Do you think that they shot you just to get your jewelry? I don't know. Drop that joint, DJ, enough. Who shot you? Separate the weak from the house. We hard to creep these Brooklyn streets. It's all, nigga. Fuck all that bigger and beef. I can hear sweat trickling down your cheek. Your heartbeat sounds like that's what feet. Thundering, shaking the concrete. Nigga shot me five times, I came out of jail and sold five million Them niggas can't fuck with us, that fat fuck only sold two million He had half of New York rapping on this shit Fat motherfucking Biggie came in the gang gonna try to cross a nigga Dropped, hit him up, that nigga quiet as fuck, he ain't got shit to say His wife pregnant, that nigga wait like an expected father not knowing who the baby is The world don't know I use the rubber so it ain't more I fuck this bitch and sold five million, that's death row style, west side baby that's ridiculous, you know what I'm saying? But then I also understand that if you was to get shot five times, your mind is just completely spinning, you know what I'm saying? You're real confused about your situation. There is no mercy in my heart. You know what I mean? I'm not out here on the wild shit like I was before. This is not the same to believe I'm just very pissed off. And this ain't, don't tell me ain't nothing wrong and we should all be together. And if you're gonna act like you a gangster or a G or the king of New York, I'm expect that. And when you don't come through, then I'm gonna wanna crush your empire. And that's what it's time for. East Coast vs West Coast beef is known as one of the biggest rivalry in hip hop history that resulted death of both artists from both sides. To understand this beef, we have to go back in 1993 where Puff Diddy founded his new record label known as Bad Boy Records. In 1993, producer Sin Combs aka Puff Daddy founded the New York based label known as Bad Boy Records. The next year, the Brooklyn based rapper known as the Notorious B.I.G. and Long Island based rapper known as Craig Mack became intermediate critical and commercial success and seemed to revitalize the East Coast hip hop scene by 1994. On November 30, 1994, California-based rapper known as Tupac Shakur was shot five times and robbed in the lobby of Quar Recording Studio in Manhattan. Tupac accused the notorious B.I.G., Sin Combs, and Andre Harville of being involved. Shortly after Tupac's shooting, Usatya by Biggie Smalls was released. Although Biggie and Puff Daddy denied having anything to do with the shooting and stated that Kusatya was recorded before the shooting, Tupac and the majority of hip hop community interpreted it's a B.I.G. way of taunting him. In 1995, Death Row CEO Suge Knight took a shot at Bad Boy Records and Puff Diddy at the Ear Source Award, announcing to the assembly of artists and industry figures, any artists out there that want to be an artist and want to stay a star and don't have to worry about the executive producer trying to be all in the videos, all in the records, dancing, come to this row. It was direct reference to Puff Daddy for appearing and dancing in their videos. With the ceremony being held in New York to the audience, nice comments appear to be an attack to entire East Coast hip hop scene and resulted in many boos from the crowd. Same year, Knight posted the $1.4 million bail of then incarcerated Tupac Sakur in exchange of his signing with this row. Shortly after the rap was released for five counts of sexual abuse in October 1995, he proceeded to join Suge Knight in furthering Destro and Bad Boy Feud. Tensions were further escalated with the release of the Dog Pounds music video for their song New York New York, which featured a gigantic Snoop Dogg destroying various New York buildings. It was interpreted by many as a direct insult toward New York and the East Coast. Although the song itself does not feature any dishes, the dog pound was allegedly even sought at while making the video in New York City. In early 1996, in response to the song New York New York, the duo Copone and Norega featuring Mob Deep and Gaddafi along with the producer Marley Marl released the single LA LA which introduced New York New York's hook. Remixes the original beat both in Iraq and Kuwait mix and in the music video shows the same air source of Manhattan as well as Havoc and Prodigy beating up and showing DPZ member Kurop inside the trunk of car before releasing him in a plug and chasing him on the top of the rooftops and killing him. After the release of Who Shot Ya by Biggie Smalls, 
Tupac appeared on numerous tracks, aiming and threatening Biggie Smalls Love that and song. Bad Boy Records. Whenever it comes on, songs, it makes me that Tupac, this is Biggie Smalls and Bad Boy Records, were against all the odds, bomb forced, and most notably, hit him up. During this time, the media became heavily involved and dubbed the rivalry of East Coast was a West Coast rap war. This resulted in fans choosing the sides. Although an official retaliation record was never released by Biggie Smalls or Puff Daddy, but certain lyrics from his catalog were interpreted by listeners me as feel strong. I thought I told you that we will. Were... West Coast Puff Daddy denies all these theories claiming that Biggie Smalls would call Tupac Shakur by his name if he were to diss him. On 13 September 1996, Tupac Shakur died after being shot multiple times six days earlier in a drive-by shooting in Las Vegas, Nevada. Although the gunman remains unknown, the murder is generally attributed to the Southside Creep Street gang, possibly shooter Orlando Anderson, who are believed to have shot Tupac Shakur we back and cruising through the Harlem. of one of his members by Tupac Shakur and his entourage of few hours earlier. Six months after Tupac dead, the notorious B.I.G. was killed in a drive-by shooting by an unknown person in Los Angeles, California on date 9 March 1997. To this day, both murders remain officially unsolved, yet many believe Suge Knight to be involved in death of both artists. As I have already mentioned earlier in the video, after the death of Tupac Shakur, Suge Knight and his death row empire came crashing out. Every artist of death row were leaving the record or filing lawsuit against Suge Knight. It was definitely one of the hardest times for Suge Knight. He was facing multiple charges after Tupac died. It's like trouble always found a way to Suge Knight. In 1996, he was incarcerated for probation violation and was sent to jail pending a hearing on probation violation that happened on September 7, 1996. When Suge Knight and his death row entourage, including Tupac, attacked Orlando Anderson in MGM Grand Hotel of Las Vegas. This resulted nine years in prison for Suge Knight but was granted early release on August 6, 2001. But short after in 2003, Suge Knight was sent to prison again for violating parole when he stuck a parking lot attendant. Death row income was rapidly declining because Suge was in and out of prison. In 2006, he was engaged in another dispute with Snoop Dogg after Snoop insulted him in an interview with Rolling Stone magazine. In January of 2008, it was stated by Fares that Knight was one of the members of Mob Pyre Street Gang in a crackdown by authorities in the city of Compton. At the same year of 2008, Suge Knight officially accepted that him and his death row empire have fallen apart and filed for bankruptcy. Sue claims that he have no longer any money in the bank. He also filed a lawsuit against Kanye West and his associates. The lawsuit focused on August 2005 shooting at Kanye West Pre Video Music Award Party, where Knight was wounded by a gunshot to the upper leg. His trouble with law and legal issues kept on going in future. In 2009, he had altercation at private party in Scottsdale Hotel, where he was taken to emergency hospital. In 2012, Suge was arrested in car after they found several drugs and cannabis in his car. In 2014, Suge was shot at a pre-video music award party hosted by Chris Brown. He was shot six times. Even though he was shot six times at that time, he was able to walk from the venue to an ambulance and he underwent a surgery. But after all these charges, Suge Knight pleaded guilty in 2015 hit and run case that landed him 28 years of prison sentence. This charge was the official legal issue that took the freedom and everything from Suge Knight. On January 29, 2015, Knight crashed his car into two men, killing Teddy Carter, who was a co-founder of Heavyweight Records. He fled the scene. The second victim was a filmmaker, Cleese Sloan, who suffered multiple fractures and head injuries. Security footage showed Knight running over both men, but Knight said he acted on self-defense. When September of 2018 arrived, Suge pleaded guilty to manslaughter, the judge sentenced to 28 years in prison. As of now, Suge is incarcerated at San Diego, California. The life of Suge Knight was always a roller coaster. He grew up in Compton, California and was always surrounded by violence and gang activities. 
He played football for most of his life and always dreamed to get in NFL. He was really good at football and he joined NFL team Los Angeles Rams and even went to Japan with them. But after he dropped football, he started working out as bodyguard and eventually making it to music business. He founded Death Row Records and gave us some best classic albums of hip hop history like All Eyes On Me from Tupac Shakur and The Chronic from Dr. Dre. The media and social media always show the negative side of Suge Knight but never his positive side. If it ain't for Suge then Dr. Dre would probably never get chance to leave Ruthless Record. If it ain't for Suge then Snoop Dogg would be behind the bars serving life in prison. If it ain't for Suge then Tupac will never be that big he is now today. Yeah, Suge Knight did some horrible, horrible things. But here also did and contributed so much good and positive things for hip hop. Yeah.